In the 20th and 21st century, it has been full of bloodshed. According to Professor Carter, he says that the 20th century has been the most bloodiest century ever. More blood has been spilled in this century than in any other time in known history. And then they say religion causes wars. More people have died under the banner of secular ideologies rather than the banner of religion from a numbers game. The root terror is actually the state or the ideological type of terror because far more innocents have died. For example, Zbigniew Brzezinski in his publication Out of Control, Global Turmoil on the Eve of the 21st Century. It was published in 1993. He said lives have been deliberately extinguished by politically motivated carnage. And he gives us some numbers. The war dead alone in the 21st century, and just listen to this, the war dead alone for politically motivated reasons is 87 and a half million people. Not 3,911, which is wrong and we disagree with. Not around 60 people in 77 in the United Kingdom, which is wrong and we disagree with. But look at the real type of terrorism. For politically motivated via state terror, 87 and a half million people. I mean, even if you were doing a numbers game, you'd be shocked. How can you hide this? 87 and a half million people for politically motivated reasons via state backed entities. So what is the real terrorism? I mean, let's wake up. State terrorism is the terrorism. This whole war on terror is like a smoke screen in a way. If this is true that 87 and a half million people have died for politically motivated reasons via secular nations and states, then we need to start talking about what is the real terror. And the real terror here is without a doubt state-backed terrorism. And we saw this in Iraq, 1.2 million people dying. We saw this in Afghanistan, thousands dying. We saw this with the use of depleted uranium on the tips of bombs when they were bombing the Gulf and it created like a covert nuclear weapon if you like. There's still radiation clouds there, still there's DU dust in the atmosphere. Children are being born and, and they're deformed, they have no faces, they have no arms. So even just scratching the surface you see the real terror is state terrorism. Now we're not saying what state. The point is Muslims we need to be just and speak the truth, even if it's against our own selves. And we should speak like this. So when a certain nation does wrong, we should say it. This is part of commanding the ma'ruf and forbidding the munkar, for commanding the good and forbidding the evil, something that we all have to do. And if we do not do this, our piety will not get us anywhere. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, and I'm paraphrasing the hadith, that there was a evil town and God told the angels to destroy the town. But they saw a pious man who worships Allah. And they said, Ya Allah, there's a pious man here. And Allah says, destroy him first with the town. Because true piety manifests in also commanding the good and forbidding the evil because he didn't do nothing about it. His heart wasn't inclining to change the situation. So look at this state terror. 87 and a, and a half million, million innocent deaths for politically motiva motivated reasons in the 21st century. So, this is actually the real terrorism. It takes a five minute discussion to discuss what is terrorism and who's, who are the real terrorists, okay? And we've done that already. Yes, we know Muslims who do naughty things are wrong and we condemn this. But we have to call a spade and spade and look at the greatest terror, which as we know by one of the definitions is the killing of innocents for politically motivated reasons. And we see 87 and a half million innocents via secular state secular states 
and secular backed institutions. So now I think the discussion should be about what some people think terrorism is because they think it's jihad. Terrorism is not jihad and jihad is not terrorism. And I want to take you through a journey, an intellectual journey so you could really understand this. And before we do that, we have to understand fighting in itself. Now, there have been many anthropological studies, which is the study of culture, the study of nations, on war and fighting, various studies on war and fighting. And they have all in included or concluded that fighting is a human reality. It existed before religion, it exists during religion, and it's existed after religion in post-secular nations. So fighting is a human reality, it happens, okay? Now the reasons for fighting differ. Some people fight to defend themselves, others to attack enemies. Some do it to gain land, natural resources, they do it for geopolitics. But in summary, war and fighting are human phenomena and they're not particular to any religion or race. Fighting, war, is not particular to any religion or race. And as we know, there are many modern wars that we know of, especially in our lifetime. An example is the US and UK fighting for oil and strategic dominance in Iraq and Afghanistan. And even the support of Libya, I would argue, was obviously more of a European project with the French and the British because we see that strategically Libya is very important because it's an access to the resources of Africa. It gives a good channel to Africa and also because of oil. So let's not be under any kind of illusion that when one of the state secretaries or a representative of the United States of America, when the UN came together to announce this, when they said we're doing it to prevent innocent lives. I mean, that's, that's a joke. I mean, I mean, to believe they did it for innocent lives and why aren't they in other countries that are destroying other people? I mean, it's, it's, it's duplicit. It's because of American interests. And this is what we hear. They're, even very, they're very bold about this. When you hear Obama and others they say American interests, they even read some of the narratives. Look at the news. They always say what's in British interests, what's in American interests. So, you know, don't be under any illusion this is to do with humanitarian effort. So we know fighting is a, a natural human phenomenon. So what about fighting in Islam? Well, we know Islam being a practical religion, it's a deen. It's not a religion, it's a world view. It's a comprehensive way of life. It realizes that humans actually fight and engage in war. It, that's what it realizes. I mean, Allah Azzawajal knows humanity better than humanity knows itself. However, but Islam sets rules for war which are to be followed if Muslims go to war. Now, here are some of the rules of war. And the Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, his articulation of the rules of war predated and preceded the th things like the Geneva Convention. So Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was years ahead of his time because we believe he was given divine revelation. So some of these rules include no killing of innocent people, no killing of women and children, no burning of cups and trees, only fight those that fight you and no wanton destruction. This is why Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu, he was the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa first successor and is considered to have been his closest companion. He said, when the armies were ready to go out, he said, stop O people, that I may give you 10 rules for your guidance in the battlefield. Do not commit treachery or deviate from the right path. You must not mutilate dead bodies, neither, neither kill a child nor a woman nor an aged man. Bring no harm to the trees, nor burn them with fire, especially those which are fruitful. Slay not any of the enemy's flock, save for your food. You are likely to pass people who have devoted their lives to monastic or humanitarian services. Leave them alone. And this is exactly what Islam talks about when we're saying when we want to engage in fighting after diplomacy fails. We have these specific rules. I mean, we didn't come up with the term collateral damage. It's a very technical cold term, which means the killing of innocents. That's what it means. Oh, it was an inevitable death because we had to kill the majority evil people, but you know, some innocents had to die. That's what collateral damage is. We, didn't, we don't invent terms like this. Every innocent person is a person that should be mourned and we should regret. So let me just walk through some of the rights 
concerning the battlefield and combatants. Now first and foremost, we have a very general principle in the Quran in chapter 5 verse 32 when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, whoever kills a human being without any reason, like a manslaughter or corruption of the earth, it is as though he has killed the whole of mankind. So what it tells us now is that Allah Azza wa Jalla is telling us that to kill someone, it has to be via a due process, via law or via just reasons. This is why Allah in the Quran in chapter 6 verses 151, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Do not kill a soul which Allah has made sacred except through due process of law. And this is why the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, The greatest sins are to associate something with God, shirk, and to kill human beings. Now, Im immediately after the verse of the Holy Quran, of the Noble Quran, which was mentioned in the connection of the right to life, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, and whoever saves a life, it is as though he has saved the lives of all of mankind. So we see these values from the Quran and Sunnah really being strong about killing innocence and killing in an unjust way. Following from this, we also have the rights of combatants. For example, we're not allowed to torture. And we're not allowed to torture with fire as well. In the hadith of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, they could be found in Abu Dawood. The Prophet said, punishment by fire does not behave anyone except the master of the fire, Allah Azza wa Jal. Also we have protection of the wounded. The Prophet Muhammad said, do not attack a wounded person. Also we have that prisoners of wars should not be slain. The Prophet was very clear and he said, no prisoner of war should be put to the sword. Also, the Prophet Muhammad said no one should be tied to be killed. He said, rather, the narration goes that the Prophet has prohibited the killing of anyone who is tied or is in captivity. Also, we have teachings concerning the looting and the destruction in the enemy's country. It's been narrated in a hadith in Al-Bukhari and Abu Dawood that the Prophet said, the Prophet has prohibited the believers from loot and plunder. And in another hadith in Abu Dawood, the Prophet ﷺ said, the loot is no more lawful than the pig. So it's these prohibitions. Obviously, we also believe in the sanctity of a dead body. In a hadith that could be found in Al-Bukhari and Abu Dawood, the Prophet ﷺ said, the Prophet has prohibited us from mutilating the corpses of the enemies. Also, we believe in returning the corpses to the enemy. There was a time when the unbelievers presented 10,000 dinars to the Prophet ﷺ and requested that the dead body of the fallen warrior may be handed over them. And the Prophet ﷺ replied, I do not sell dead bodies. You can take away the corpse of your fallen comrade. And also we believe in the prohibition of the breach of treaties when we're engaged in war. If we have a treaty with someone, we cannot breach any treaty. Islam has strictly prohibited this. Now one of the instructions that the Prophet ﷺ gave to the Muslim warriors, if you like, when he was sending them to the battlefield, he said, do not be guilty of the breach of faith or the breach of treaties. Now, look at this. Take these amazing, beautiful narratives and values and contrast them to what happens in the West on a practical level. Now, when Western nations invade countries, you see so many innocents die. I mean, look at 1.2 million people in Iraq, thousands in Afghanistan, and even the BBC, the British Broadcasting Corporation, reports that, you know, the smart bombs? You know, they're supposed to invent these smart bombs that are laser guided and they only kill enemies that they said they're not so smart, they only 40% only of them hit the targets. Now, I want to use the Zionists as an example to see how unjust their foreign policy is. Take the IDF as an example. They murdered hundreds of Egyptian prisoners of war in the, both the 1956 and 19, 1967 wars. In 1967, the Zionists expelled 
a hundred thousand and two hundred sixty thousand or between a hundred thousand and two hundred sixty thousand Palestinians from the newly conquered West Bank and drove almost a hundred thousand Syrians from the Golan Heights according to Amnesty International Israel has destroyed more than 10,000 homes between 1967 and 2003 Israel was complicit in the Sabra and Shatila massacre of 3,000 innocent lives we don't see this mourned every year by the West, do we? We remember the 3,000 lives in 9-11, but what about the massacre of innocent human beings in Sabra and Shatila? I'm not saying, I'm not trying to compare the two, but I'm saying is the blood of a Muslim less worth than the blood of a non-Muslim? Is that what people are trying to say? Islam doesn't believe in this. We believe in every human blood has equal value from this perspective. Israel was complicit in this massacre and after an Israeli investigation, the commission found the defense minister, Ariel Sharon, to bear personal responsibility, quote unquote. During the relatively recent Lebanese war, the IDF fired over one million bomblets, one million, in a population of 650,000 in southern Lebanon. That's like two bombs per person and one Israeli soldier said what we did was insane and monstrous Human Rights Watch concluded Israel has violated one of the most fundamental tenets of the laws of war the duty to carry out attacks on only military targets now professor of political science John Mersheimer and professor of international affairs Stephen Walter they state Viewed objectively, Israel's past and present conduct offers little moral basis for privileging it over the Palestinians. We know Israel is the target of 65 UN resolutions. The themes of these resolutions include, and I'm quoting, the major themes reflected in the UN resolutions against Israel over the years are its unlawful attacks on its neighbors, its violations of the human rights of the Palestinians, including deportations, demolitions of homes, and other collective punishments. Its confiscation of Palestinian land, its establishment of illegal settlements, and its refusal to abide by the UN Charter and the 1949 Fourth Geneva Convention relative to the protection of civilian, civilian persons in a time of war. And this is one example, this is using the Zionist entity. If I were to talk to you about the United States of America, I mean, subhanAllah, what they've done to South America alone, they've been very intimate in the political affairs of the Latin Americans and Europe itself and Africa. I mean, we could go on and on and on, but if we were here, we'd be here until Ramadan. So, this is for your own research to check out for yourself. So, I use the Zionists as an example.